Thank you. Thank you, Terry. I couldn't help but think a minute about when Terry was introducing me and talking about um, some of your future tours, talking about the cemetery tours. As uh, Terry mentioned, my son uh, organizes cabin days out of our farm and it's open to the public. And one time he needed some extra help and he said, Dad, I need some help down here. We've got, we got people asking questions. I have some family ties to Blacksburg here and all that. But, uh, the Ingalls and all that. So anyhow, the, uh, there are people asking questions about the Ingalls family and some of the genealogies. I, we, need, we need your help. And I said, where do you want me to go? And they said, well, down here by the family cemetery. And I didn't know if there was a, me a hidden meaning in that or not about <laughs> me going to, to the cemetery for... <laughs> anyhow, it happened, to be, it happened to be a hot day and it was one of the cooler places it was because it's a lot of shade trees over that. But I had to start thinking about, you know, my time will come one day, and where do I go for, for the next one? But anyhow, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my research and, and, and growing up and about how I got interested in trains because I think, uh, and I'll bring out some, some things that, uh, I'm not going to talk about how powerful the Y6B is or something like that and everybody give me the glazed look, you know. But I will say that as, uh, as a, in my boyhood, my earliest recollections were something to do with trains. Probably by the time I was age four, uh, I started recognizing the, uh, and become fascinated with, with the steam trains. Because through our farm was a branch line between Radford and of those of you that are familiar with the area of Clater Dam and where it's located, just right below Clater Dam is a rock quarry. And uh, back in the 40s, soon after World War II, about the time I was four, I was realizing that a steam train was bringing in empty hoppers, going up to the car and then bringing unloaded trains out. And it became a source of, uh, of fascination with me. And, um, and, and so uh, this is before I was going to public schools. Uh, and of course it was at Radford, there was a lot, of st a lot of activity going on within the uh, Radford rail yard and, and the lines going through Radford at the time. So, I had a very early recollection that uh, the trains, you know, and what they were. And Radford was a very busy place for the railroad at that time. But you got to understand by the time I was age six, uh, we lived in the county at that time, right next to the city limits of the city of Radford. But I went to a city school. Now for all of you people that are in Montgomery County, uh, I was supposed to go to, to Reiner, to school. But they didn't have school buses, so anyhow, I was able to go to the Radford City Schools because all my friends and all, all of our associations was in Radford, but I would otherwise have to go to Reiner, which was 45 minutes to an hour away on a bus. And in about 1953, they did start sending a bus in front of my house, so my parents had to pay $10 a month tuition to go to the Radford City Schools. But that's another story. So anyhow, we had one car. And uh, so when the... And so my dad's office was downtown, and and I went to the uh, Radford College uh, to McGuffey School there. And after school was out, I'd have to go uptown and wait until Dad went home, which was only about four mi four miles away. But I would go and uh, and start watching the trains sitting beside the tracks. Now there's a signal tower that they're getting ready to take down in Radford, but I feel like I own that because. I sat under that thing a lot longer than probably any one place that I've been other than the seat of a tractor or something like that in my current life. But anyhow, uh, I used to watch the trains. And I watched them daily. And then I got to know not only what was going on around the rail yard, like Time Freight 51 would come through about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon and switch some cars out, and then the Tennessean would number 40, uh, Passenger train 45, and it went from Washington to uh, to Memphis. And I got to watch all these trains come through, and I started recognizing the times that they would do. And then I started meeting some people. And my dad was in the Rotary Club, and in the Rotary Club there were some people that were railroaders. And Ra Radford in the early 1950s had about about 400 people working for the railroad. It was a, a big operation there. And it wasn't the largest employer in Radford. But Radford had been a railroad town from its beginning, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But there was a lot of people there that worked for the railroad. 
Uh, Radford College probably employed almost the same many people as the railroad, but you had the pipe shop with 1,200 people. But the railroad was about 400, uh, about 400 employees, and everybody was connected with the railroad, usually in a neighborhood. And so you had people like uh, Bob Hayslip, who was a train master there. He was the one that ensured that trains got through Radford and, and proceeded where they were supposed to go to on time and all that. And there was Tom Gravitt in the Rotary Club, and he was he, one of the yard masters. He was ensured that everything got switched right. And then my next door, uh, the next door neighbor to a cousin of mine lived in Radford, uh, Rob Wilson. Um, uh, he worked uh, one, in one of the management positions in the engine terminal there. And every time, every month, you know, I'd see him every month, but, you know, the NW had a magazine called the NW Magazine. And every time that magazine, he made sure I got that magazine. I got to read about what was going on. So, it, so I started really getting to know the Norfolk and Western. And then I also got to know a lot of the different locomotives, you know, the types of locomotives. Uh, so there I was in Radford. And then, you know, in those days, you, you didn't have the malls and all the things that you have today, but once in a while you go to Roanoke. And I was, I mean, I was going to the city. <laughs> and in Roanoke, the city was probably a little bigger than, than it is today, because now so many people live in the county and surrounding areas, but the, the, the area of the city of Roanoke was up right at 100,000. Today, it's, I, I think it's about 90 to 92 or something like that. But that was the home of the Norfolk and Western. That was the, where the great Roanoke shops were located, that, where they built these big giant engines. And, uh, and so you had the yard. You go down Shenandoah Avenue and you go by and you see all the engines switching. I mean, this, we had to go that way. You know, that's going by the old Veterans Administration and uh, going down into Roanoke. And I mean, they get to see locomotives and. And, uh, and that was the headquarters. And then, of course, once in a while, we'd go to the pasture station uh, for whatever reason. Sometimes I was riding a train, but I'd get off, and it was just a lot of activity going on. In those days, you could get on a train and go anywhere. Um, if you want to go to Chicago, want to go to Norfolk, want to go, if you were a girl going to Longwood College at Farmville, you got on a train in Radford. I mean, you could get there. But Roanoke was the hub. Now, the railroad, the Norfolk and Western, was really a big coal hauler, but it was not known for pasture work, but it had some very fine pasture trains. But it didn't have a lot of them compared to a lot of other railroads. Well, anyhow, this fascination, you know, here I was on a farm, and we'd get to go to the county seat in Christiansburg, and, of course, the main line went through Christiansburg. And so, uh, so you can say then there was Christiansburg. And... And the, main, and the main line went through there. And sometimes, you know, you'd go over to Cambria, and there was always some trains coming through. Well, all the trains in those days, or coal trains, loaded coal trains, had to go over the, and, and Christiansburg is, is a mountain. Going from the New River up to Christiansburg, and just east of Christiansburg is the Eastern Continental Divide. Now, we all know the Continental Divide out west, where the waters go in the Pacific, and Waters go to the Atlantic or Gulf of Mexico. This is the Eastern Continental Divide. It divides waters going from the Atlantic Ocean into the Gulf of Mexico through the Ohio and Mississippi River. So this was, it was a big grade there. And I remember one time, a couple of reminiscences, you know, I have about that is uh, we went to a, a, a farm equipment and supply store in Cambria. And all of a sudden, one of the big Class J's shiny engines showed up with about 15 or 16 cars gliding into the station coming uphill. And that impressed me. I got to see this magnificent train. One day, it was over at the Christiansburg station, and, just, and I have a friend that I grew up with that lived over there. His name is Judge Ray Grubb. Some of you know him. And Ray and I grew up together. And uh, every time I go to see Ray, we'd end up you know, go over to the train stations, just watch the trains, you know. And then one day we got to the train station, these coal cars just rumbling them by. And all of a sudden, here's the pusher on the back of that train. And I mean, the ground was trembling as it went by. Cinders were coming out everywhere. Uh, in farm parlance, everything was wide open but the toolbox on that engine when it was working. It was really working hard. Well, you know, you don't see that with a diesel today. I still get impressed watching trains. 
Ray Smoot and I can sit and watch trains a long time, but anyhow, <laughs> but when we do, but it's just not quite the same. But I still, those big magnificent diesels that are very powerful in their own way, but it, it's not a steam engine. And uh, so anyhow, but Ray and I would also ride the Huckleberry. The, 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 the mixed train, I did was part freight with a passenger car from Christburg to Blacksburg and back. Now one time toward the end of the time, I remember we went over there and got a round trip ticket from Christburg to Blacksburg and back. Cost 41 cents. <laughs> and uh, Ray and I were the only two passengers on the train. <laughs> so I know they didn't make any passenger money on us that day, but we had a good time. But the, that was something. But that train would leave Christiansburg and come over here to Blacksburg. We'd get off here at the station. By the way, the station is about where this building right here is. And I'll talk a little bit about that because I, I, I not only wrote it as a, as, a, um, as, a, as a civilian, for example, riding the trains from Christopher Blackburn, but I also wrote as a cadet out of here a few times like Jim Flynn and I did. But anyhow, we'd ride to Huckleberry, get off, and then the train would have to go back to Christenberg, but they didn't have a way to turn the engine here, so you'd take the engine off the front, put it on the back of the train, but it'd be going tender first back to back to Christiansburg, but it was always, you know, uh, if you're going fast, it was probably 30, 35 mile an hour, but I think the speed limit in the timetables said 20, but I think they went a little faster than that at times. Well, you know, that was kind of how I got interested in this thing, and then all of a sudden, by the time I was 16 years old or so, steam left Radford, and the railroad dieselized. Why, well, goodness, what a terrible thing this was, and uh, because I always kind of had a hanking, boy, if it, somehow I could be a locomotive engineer, I could be one. I was going to be one on a steam engine. But then I didn't really have that opportunity. And then all of a sudden I went off to college and came over here and did my thing here. And then I started another career in the military. Um, started reading about the time I got out of college here about trains. I started buying books. And I started reading about what I could about steam. You know, there was always these pictorials. People would say, hey, look at this, you know, this. and there'd be a section on Union Pacific and nothing about someplace else, something about the North and Western or Pocahontas Roads, they called them, whatever here. And, and you'd read about the different kinds of engines and all that. So I learned a lot about other railroads and the steam power they had. But I always kept looking for something about the North and Western. And, and, and you'd, you'd find some things written about it, like, boy, this was a big engine, well, you know, big, long trains, well, but they never explained much about them, why they were so good. And, um, and then by the mid-1970s, uh, I realized there really wasn't a definitive work on the North and Western. And I came home for Christmas of 1974, and uh, I... I probably got too much punch one night or something or other from the Christmas holiday spirit. But I told my mother, I said, you know, you know Bob Clater who's, you know, works for the railroad. And you all, your families, you know, knew each other growing up. Uh, maybe I ought to go and talk to him and see what the possibility is of trying to do some kind of work to define what the railroad did in the steam era. Well, in February 1975, I got that meeting. And that meeting turned into an opportunity, which I, luckily, um, I took. Because not only did I meet with Bob Clater, but he informed me, he says, you know, nothing's really been done, but I, the railroad will support you any way we can with anything we have, you know, in documentation. But much of that's been thrown away. But I will get you in touch with people who would know, and you can start talking to them. Well, I started interviewing. Started my research, gathering information, started interviewing, you know, a lot of the officials that uh, some were still working, some, many had retired, but were from the steam era. And it became a fascination. Uh, I soon realized that when I was out there talking to these people, uh, many of these people in 10 years were going to be gone, and it was going to be lost forever what they knew. So I started taping all of my interviews with them. Um, and, and, you know, there were 15 or 20, but I mean, but they were pretty important people. Now, I didn't know who they were then. I just, you know, I get a name, you know. You'd be talking to someone, they'd say, well, I don't know too much about that, but you need to see so-and-so over here. And so I'd call so-and-so up and talk to him, arrange an interview, sit down, and next thing you know, 
you would start, you know, getting information, but it was all verbal. Some had some document, you know, papers and things to document things, but basically it was just reconstructing what the railroad had done. Well, during this course of everything, I got some good advice, and I was also pretty lucky. Uh, at that time, I was an, an ROTC instructor at the Virginia Military Institute. God forbid a hokey being up at Lexington, <laughs> but, but it happened. <laughs> Somebody had to add some sanity would otherwise have been a brawl up there, but anyhow. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I had a, a, one of my fellow officers who was a good friend, and he, you know, uh, was a historian. But when he gave me, and the good advice he gave me was this, he says, you know, I ha he was referring to his own friend, said, you know, I knew somebody that worked on a book, said, you know, the thing you really got to do is you got to research some and then try to write what you, and find out where your gaps are and fill in the gaps. So I researched for about six months, uh, my last six months while I was up there. And, um, and I started writing. Um, what I could, and putting it down. And, and, and so by the time I left up there in the summer of 1975, I had basically written the book as, you know, the basic outline of it had been done. But I was able to identify my gaps. So when then uh, I was able to concentrate on where I, I needed research. The other part that I was lucky about not only good, good advice, but often I would go in to some place on the railroad and I would say, I'm, I'm writing a book about the railroad, and you could kind of see the attitude of people say, yeah, 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 you know, that's another one going to write a book. <laughs> and it turned, and you know, and I didn't quite understand what all this was all about. So I kept, you know, because interviewing or working with Mr. Clater, if I said I need to go down and see somebody, usually when I got down there, somebody was waiting on me, you know, and probably the railroad had something other to do than some young captain in the Army coming down here trying to find some information about a book he's going to write, because there's probably a dime a dozen of people writing books. Well, where I was lucky is at one time I made a statement. I said, uh, I don't want pictures. I want the information, then I'm going to get pictures later to determine how I can best reinforce the text that I'm trying to write about. Well, all of a sudden things started happening, and what had happened is that people come in and want to write a book, first thing they want pictures. And they'd go out the door with the pictures or whatever they came and got, but nobody ever saw the pictures again, and a book never showed up on anybody's doorstep of what was done. And so I was able to be a credible person, but that was by luck. It's just, uh, my wife would probably say it's because I'm kind of focused on what I do sometimes. So anyhow, uh, that, that all that worked well. So when I started putting uh, this manuscript together, my dad was a very accomplished writer. And my wife took the two kids and went out to visit her parents in Texas, and I had about 10 days at, hum at, at the home there that I took leave, and my dad came down and sat down and edited the book. Now my father, I have some ties to this community in a number of ways, family, but also my father was employed by VPI. He was the sports information director over here from 1927 to 1943. And in 1943, the college basically shut down because of the war, and dad wanted to get in another career, so he, he and mother moved to their family farm. My mother was in Ingalls and moved back to the Ingalls farm in Radford. But my dad was a very good writer, and so he came down and said, Dad, you need to edit this thing. Well, we'd go to bed about 3 o'clock in the morning, then we'd get up about 10 and have breakfast and start about noon. What I had as initial manuscript, and he would start editing. Really had some good times with my father because, you know, I look back on it. My dad and I, while we were fairly close growing up, that time in our life was very special to me because I was doing something my dad really liked. Now, Dad was a good baseball player in college, but never he, but the, he was offered a scholarship to Roanoke College, but he wanted to come to Tech, so he went to Tech and turned down the scholarship. But, you know, to throw a football, throw a baseball is okay, but Dad loved to read and to write. So he, can, and we developed a bond over that that it was very good. Well, anyhow, that was my last six months 
while here in Virginia, other than I went to Norfolk for six months after that. So I did drive back for an interview or two back in, in, in this area before I left. But I went overseas next and spent 13 months in Turkey. Um, Turkey didn't have much steam where I was located over there, although they had it in the eastern Turkey, eastern part, but I was in the western part of it. But, you know, the, when the, my assignments officer said, uh, you know, called him and said, well, know if I wanted to take an assignment in Turkey, you know, my first thing was hell no kind of answer. And, uh, but then I thought, well, maybe they do have uh, steam over, I get to see something. And I'm going to go someplace in the world I've never, probably won't go again. And I haven't since I left there and 30 some years ago. But anyhow, I went to Turkey, and after that I went to Texas. So I wasn't back close to the source, but because I wrote that manuscript and I found my gaps, I was able to start writing and ask questions for the things that I wanted to get answers to. And then, then I mentioned, you know, uh, photos before. There's a time when you have to start getting photos. And when you start getting photos together for a book that's a documentary, you know, you can, you can write a whole lot of detail and information, but the pictures is what a lot of people get interested in, and it reinforces what you're trying to say in a text. So I, I, I had to work on that. And my assignment in Texas at that time was in a test unit. I didn't have much family life. I had plenty of army life, but not much family life while I was in Texas. We were in a test unit, and I'd have to go to the field like on a Monday morning and come back about Thursday, about 10, 11 o'clock at night, and I had a commander who says, you, you don't leave until you put the ho horse in the barn, which means you had to clean everything and get it put away. So I usually got home about daybreak on Friday. The next week I'd be in garrison getting ready for the week after that, which you'd go back for another four days to the field and test what we were trying to do. But my family life was like I got home at night in time for the kids to be in pajamas and have supper and they go to bed. And I'd get up before anybody else was up and I'd be back to work and then I'd come in and by Saturday I'd crash and burn. And then by Sunday I'd get up and try to take whatever I was trying to do business-wise for family and then they'll go back and start the cycle on Monday morning again. And in the meantime all this, I acquired about 400 photographs and which the publisher wanted the captions to it. So I had to start working on captions. And uh, so anyhow, that's part of it. And like I said, I had a publisher. And I had to, sometime in all this mix, I had to start also finding somebody to publish the book. I tried the University of Virginia, University of North Carolina, Indiana, University of Indiana Press, and none of them wanted, didn't want that particular kind of book. And then I finally bumped into somebody that recommended Pruitt Publishing Company out of Boulder, Colorado. And I said, well, if I ever get, I've never been to Colorado, so if I have to go out there and see them, at least I'll go to Boulder. So, and they said, well, We'd be interested in this kind of a uh, book. And I, so we came to terms on the thing, and, and uh, th so that was my publisher. But it wor really worked very well. Well, anyhow, um, the original book came out in 1980, so in five years I put it out. This is, a, this is the copy I gave my mother and dad. And uh, so it's a little bit worn, but you can, we'll, you can see this after the presentation. But there was a... Uh, there was a painter of railroad scenes called, named Howard Fogg, and he did this dust cover painting, supposedly was commissioned by Pruitt Publishing Company to do this dust cover. And I, I'd never met Howard Fogg, but we corresponded, because I was aware of his, I was aware of his uh, paintings, and, 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 and a lot of times you'd go to Leaning Tree, and they published them in these Leaning Tree Christmas cards that you used to be able to get. And uh, he had quite a number of them. But anyhow, I know where the original of that is, and, uh, and I've become a friend with the person that now owns it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But anyhow, that book was published 1980 and went out of print in 1993. And then I'll go into my next phase, which was nothing more than I retired from the Army in 1991, went back to the family farm and started farming. In the meantime, I, I saw Bob Clater one time, and I think we were riding in the 1218 or the 611. I can't remember which one it was at the time. But he, I told him that, the, that this book is going out of print. And he says, well, let it go out of print and wait a few years, and you can probably get it reprinted and revised, you know, and all that when the demand comes up on it. Yeah, well, Bob Clater died not long after that in 1993. 
And, um, and it languished for about 10 years. But in the meantime, I became a member of the Norfolk and Western Historical Society based out of Roanoke. And they have an archives. And one of the people that I met uh, researching the book was an employee of the railroad when I first met him. But he was basically the keeper of all the mechanical drawings of all the steam power. However, the railroad had gotten rid of them. They took it down in a basement and were going to throw them away because in 1964 there was a big merger with the Nickel Plate and Warbash Railroads and the railroad needed space. And they were getting rid of, you know, about 40,000 documents they took to the basement and they didn't know what to do with it. Well, Mark Fable was his name. Uh, he went to the uh, bosses and all that and said, you know, somebody needs to save this. And they said, he said, well, I'll... Nobody knew what to do, so he said, well, I'll take some home if you don't mind me doing it every day, and I'll take care of them so they're not lost. Well, he went home with 40,000 documents over a period of however many months or a year, and, and when I knew him, he had them in his basement, which I never went down to his basement, but I went to his house, but he had them all cataloged and everything. Well, Mark died in, in uh, 1994 or something like that, and one of his only son was an L company uh, in the Corps of Cadets a year behind me and in the same barracks or dorm that I was in. And uh, so anyhow, uh, Mark asked me, do you, know, do you know my son? He gave his name and I said, no, I don't, I don't remember him. Well, anyhow, one day at church, we had some people in the back of the church that came in, a man and woman, and I went by and after the church service introduced myself and he said, I'm Ward Fable. I said, you any kin to Mark? And knowing that his son's name was Ward. And he said, yeah, I was my father. So anyhow, I became a, and then a friend of him. And later, when he had to get rid of his parents' house, he said, I got to get rid of all these documents. And I said, he said, can you help me? I said, I think I can, but don't do anything until I get back to you. And I went to the NW Historic Society, and they were able to strike a deal and get all these 40,000 documents in the archives. Well, that became a good thing for me because there were some things that I was not able to research on the first one. Sometimes I'd say before 1933, this occurred, but I couldn't pinpoint it. But when I got to all these documents that they got, when I started research, I could say, well, it was in 1932 that occurred, or 31, and I could give you the month almost. So anyhow, that all this sort of thing started working, and then I decided it's time to, you know, maybe in the early 2000s start revising my book and bring it up to date. And, uh, and, and I published it through the, uh, in 2005, I published it through the NAW Historic Society and this is the revised edition that's now in print and is uh, available. Um, about the same size, got the same, I got permission from the guy now owns this picture to use it again in the dust cover. Howard Fogg has since, you know, passed away. But anyhow, this is it, and, uh, and so it's the revised edition. Now, while it has a lot of the same material as before, it has a lot more in it because I was, after 25 years from the time I published the first, um, my office probably looks like uh, Mark Fable's basement <laughs> with all the stuff that I've collected. And I got to get down and catalog that one day. That's getting to be, and my wife, she keeps making noises about, I want you to clean your office up. And I'm saying, you know, i got to move cattle and do some other things today. And when I come in at 8 o'clock at night, I don't want to sit down and start cleaning my office. I really want to sit down at that moment. But anyhow, she's not here to defend herself, so I can say that. <laughs> but anyhow, um, I need to do that. But I did put out the revised edition, and it is available now. Well, that's kind of the background and uh, how I got, came about to, to put a book together. But then I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, about the local history of the Norfolk and Western in the area. Because there's some connections not only I have in Radford, but also here in Blacksburg. Uh, first of all, the original, the original predecessor for the Norfolk and Western was, in this area was the Virginia and Tennessee Railroad, which was chartered to run a railroad between um, uh, west out of Lynchburg, westward over the Alleghenies, and connect into one of the railroad systems out in southwestern Virginia, which turned out to be Bristol, and and and, and what became the Southern Railway. 
and and they got a charter in the 1840s to start construction on that, and they did. It went, you know, through what is Bedford and uh, came down um, uh, through uh, a place called Big Lick, and uh, which is now Roanoke, but it just it was not anything there except just a you know a name basically, and came over the Allegheny Mountains, what is now Christiansburg, and down to the New River. And then came through along the New River, and then turned and followed, coursed itself over Hill and Dale, uh, what later became, uh, you know, Dublin, Withfield, and all these other places, going westward. Well, they established in 1854 uh, a a depot called Central Depot in what is now Radford. And so, in 1954, we celebrated in Radford the centennial of the founding of the city of Radford, which was known then as Central. So Radford really started as a railroad town. And the reason why Central got its name was because it was midway between Lynchburg and Bristol. It's about 100 miles each way. And that was the central point of the railroad. And, uh, and so the railroad, um, had a terminal there, and all the trains leaving Lynchburg had to go to the Central. And, and this engine here, you can look at it later on, but this old engine here was called the Roanoke. But this is prior to anything called Roanoke, this community. But this caption on here, which I won't read you know, all of it, but it just says it was this engine here was used out of Central for years on the, westward, on the uh, Western freights, meaning out of Central Depot working toward Bristol. And it also said that it weighed about 78,000 pounds, which was about, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good size engine for the 1850s. But it said it was this engine right here, the Y6B, which was with a coal train along the New River. And that, by the way, that's McCoy across the river, so you're near here at a place called Dry, Dry Branch where this engine is going, but the Y6B weighed 12 times more than that engine there did, and this engine was built around the 18, uh, 1940s. This is a particular engine, 1948 and 49. So the engines got a lot bigger over time, but that was the, the original uh, types of engine used, and then that's what ended up with the railroad, and I talk about that kind of engine in, the, uh, in my book. Well, Radford was a major activity as railroad. Now, some people in old timers, I used to, when I was growing up, say Radford, you, you was competing against Roanoke. I have never found anything really say that compete against Roanoke because Radford was a very important place. But when Roanoke was created in 1882, because there was the shops there and also a railroad came down the Shandor Valley and tied into the railroad at Big Lick at, at what later became Roanoke, that's when Roanoke was incorporated and it became a big railroad town. Radford really was not competing for Roanoke, but Radford was important in its own way because you had a line that started at Radford and went to the Pocahontas coal fields in 1883, and that opened up the Pocahontas coal traffic, which the railroad became famous for and made money with it and designed and built some of the finest steam engines that's ever been built. But Radford's where that started. You had lines going not only to Bristol, but later Blacks, uh, at, um, at Pulaski went off to Galax, called the North Carolina branch. And that went down that way. And a lot of activities. So when I was growing up, you know, in, in the 50s, you had a lot of activities. You know, you had eight passenger trains going through Radford each way each day. Or four each way each day, eight total. And three of those were joint southern, uh, north and western trains, the Tennessean, the uh, Birmingham Special, and the, and the uh, Pelican. And they all went from Washington either to Memphis, Birmingham, or New Orleans. Then you had a local. But then you go to Christiansburg and catch anything you wanted to going to Chicago, like through the way of Portsmouth and Cincinnati and all that area, on the north and western trains. So you could go anywhere around here or go on a train, but there's a lot of activities. 1921, it created a tie treating plant over there. And they pressure treated all these cross ties and bridging timbers that were used. So you had that going on. In 1954, they closed the engine terminal at Pulaski. So all the trains dispatched to work the yards in Pulaski 
came out of Radford and also went to Galax and back came out of Radford. Then you had the Potts Valley Shifter, which and went down the New River down past McCoy and go down toward Eggleston and that area, but it went over and serviced the Potts Valley branch, which is, uh, used to be about 30 or 40 miles long, but by the 50s it was only five. And then you had the Huckleberry. The trains left Radford and went up to Christiansburg, and then they actually, that's, you couldn't ride from Radford on the Huckleberry, but you could from, you could from Christiansburg to Blacksburg and back like Ray Grubbs and I did for 41 cents, but you couldn't do that from Radford. It went up, but it was a mixed freight, and they would f take freight cars and switch them out here and there along the way, and at, at, uh, at Christiansburg, they would also switch the yards up there. So there was a lot of things going on, and then, of course, when I talk about the Galax line, uh, there, was a, there was a freight that went to Galax back every day, but about 75 loads of car loads of uh, mining ore and limestone and things came off of the North Carolina branch down near Austinville and all those places because of mines and for quarries. And, uh, and there was gypsum and uh, lots of different kind of mineral mine down there. And that was a big operation. And then you had... Then you had things like the um, um, uh, Blacksburg branch, and of course, I, I, that was a, a special love in my heart on that, the Blacksburg branch. Now, Blacksburg was not a railroad town like Radford, but it had railroad service. It started off here as the Virginia Anthracite, and Coal, uh, Anthracite Coal and Railway Company in 1902, and completed a line from the Merrimack Mines back to Christiansburg as a separate company. By 1904, the line had been extended here into Blacksburg. Just not quite nine miles in length. And, uh, and so that, but the railroad, the Virginia Anthracite Coal and Railway Company went bankrupt and was sold at public auction on the courthouse steps at Christiansburg in 1912 in which the Norfolk and Western Railway bought it. And in 1912, this became the, what's called the Blacksburg branch. And so, that's how the Norfolk and Western acquired that. Now, some interesting things that go on about uh, the Blacksburg branch because uh, it was here for about, uh, about 60 years. <clears throat> well, we'll talk about, uh, I was in the Corps, and Jim Flynn and I were in the same cadet company and riding the <clears throat> Corps trips out of here. But, when you talk about the Virginia Agricultural Mechanical College being started in 1872, guess when the first uh, load of cadets were moved out of this area to see something from, from uh, you know, from the college, a new co college here? Well, it was in 1877 when the cadets went from here to the state fair, but there was no railroad here. They had to walk from here to Christiansburg and catch the train, and then they took them to... They took them to, uh, to uh, Richmond. And the first trip, though, that the Cadet Corps rode out of, out of Blacksburg on was Thanksgiving Day with the VMI, BPI game in 1913. That was the year after the railroad took, the North and Western took control of it. Well, they used steam here all the way up until about the fall of 57, and after that, diesels were used here. Now, that was, uh, we'll talk about the steam for a moment, but that was really an intricate thing. You know, I, uh, they, they used in that era what we call a Class M. It was an old engine built about 1906, 1907, and they only had by the 50s about 15 of them. They needed four of them to haul the Cadet Corps because you had to have two trains, each with two engines. Because the M's was the largest engine they could use to cross the trestles and things, the weight limitation, you couldn't put a modern... So they had to use these M's, and I remember one official said they used to collect the M's in Roanoke for about a month or two and work on them to make sure they were working pretty good before they bring them up here. Because what they did, they leave Roanoke, maybe 11, 12 cars with two M's on the back going with tenders first, backing up Christiansburg Mountain all the way from Roanoke. Then they'd get to, get to Christiansburg, they had to start switching these engines around because you have to end up with the engines on here in Blacksburg on the front end of the train with the boilers pointing like normal so they could come out of here and get the, you know, faster. But they had to go up to Christiansburg, 
Then they'd have to take one engine off and move it to the front, and then they'd take the whole train through after taking water and back them. Then the Merrimack, one of the engines would come off and they'd bring the whole train past it so the other one would get on the front with the other one and back it all the way into Blacksburg. I mean, it was something. Well, you know, the, the shop general foreman in Radford said that every time they had one of those specials, he also take some of his men over here and make sure everything was okay with the engines. And he said, I'd take my wife with me. And she'd also say, golly, these cadets are sure looking a lot younger. And he said, I used to have to remind her and they weren't getting younger. She was getting older. <laughs> I won't tell his name because I'm, I'm being taped tonight. So I got to be, and that, somebody may see this. But anyhow, I knew them both. And uh, what he told me on tape probably was a little different than the way he put, told her. Because he call, actually called her baby doll. <laughs> But he didn't say baby doll on the tape. <laughs> so anyhow, it was, uh, it was interesting. And I also got to say, to me, it was a source of great fun. Of course, I only rode the cadet trips, you know, during the diesel era. But, you know, we'd have to buy a ticket. And, uh, and, you, and I don't know how much it was, a, a buck or two, one much. And, you'd, and they'd give you a ticket, and we'd have to put it in, there, in the sweatband of our of our cap, you know. So when we got on the train, you know, it wasn't like it was paid for by the cadet corps. We were buying individual tickets, so they had the conductor had to come around and pick up all the tickets. So the, you know, we our company, Company M, had a song that we always saved for when the conductor came by to collect tickets, and it cannot be repeated in mixed company. <laughs> But the funny thing was watch the reaction of the conductors when you sang this song. And you, you take 80 cadets in a car singing a song at the top of their lungs. Uh, it, I thought it sounded pretty impressive. Some of the conductors I don't think were really impressed. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, that happened. And then my last year in the cadet corps was the fall of 63. I was in the class of 64. And to my knowledge, the following fall, after that, they started busing the cadets to the Thanksgiving Day game and wherever. Now, I, if, if they did do it that fall, I, I, I'm not sure about that, but I'm, I, I've been told that. I haven't been able to find the documentation when they actually started bus, you know, busing the cadets. Well, anyhow, I talked about the Blacksburg branch, but you know, steam left Radford really about January the 1st, 1958, because all the mainline freight operations was dieselized from Roanoke to Bristol, or actually from Radford to Bristol, was one of the lines that they took all the steam off of to use it elsewhere on, on the railway. But they kept the M's there to run the Blacksburg branch. And on July the 26th, 1958, the last two M's, number 396 and 405, were retired. And that was the last two M's in service from the North and Western. And that's when they replaced them with diesels on the Blacksburg branch. And they had to go through and strengthen the bridges and all that. And so the diesels, uh, the weight distribution was totally different on a diesel than it is on a steam engine. So that gives you a little background there on the Blacksburg branch. But you know, Blacksburg had its railroad for 60 years. And it was a great time. I enjoyed those core trips, but I got to ride to Huckleberry. <laughs> I just can't quite get used to the Huckleberry Trail yet, but I just, <laughs> but I still rode to Huckleberry. Well, what is the future? Well, uh, I won't be probably working on this book anymore, the N and W Giant of Steam. But I have a good friend named Ed King, and he wrote a book about the Class A's. Now, the 1200s were the ones that were a class engine, and he really wrote a wonderful book about them called the N and W A, the Mercedes of Steam. I told Ed one time, and, and that book is uh, like this one, you know, it's, it's a documentary. But I told Ed one time, I said, you know, the engines like this one right here, the Y6s, there was a compound engine. Now, this was unique, this particular engine, because after 1930, no railroad ever built engines like this. They went to, you know, this engine here used the steam once in the rear set of cylinders, and that steam then went to the front cylinders and was expanded a second time. Very efficient, but they were not a high-speed engine. But they were a magnificent engine. But no railroad but the Norfolk and Western worked on this kind of engine after 1930, and yet the Norfolk and Western continued to tinker with this engine until by 1950, 
it could equal any 16 driver steam locomotive that has ever been built up to 25 miles an hour. And they were magnificent because they developed a tremendous amount of power at low speeds. And why? Because heavy tonnage on heavy grades or severe grades. Well, I told Ed one time, I said, now we got all these books out. I think the Y6s haven't been given the things that they're due. He said, I've been thinking about that. I want you to help me write a book on that. So we're now in a joint effort of writing. I'm up to 1936 in that book right now. But uh, we're working on the compound engines of the North and Western, starting in 1890 when that really became a big fad and a vogue and was carried on to uh, uh, 1930 when almost every railroad got rid of, uh, all the, it, didn't, it just stopped. It went to different kinds of engines that were bigger, used more fuel and more water and everything else for the amount of work they did. Railroad started using this engine right here, or kept using this engine and perfected it and made a magnificent engine out of it. So anyhow, that's what we're working on. And so that's, that's, um, that's the significance of the next book, and, and then I'm going to probably call it quits after that. Um, I appreciate your att uh, attentiveness tonight. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect here, because I don't know, you know, I didn't want to glaze everybody's eyes over talking about technical things. But uh, being a farmer, you know, with beef cattle, usually the cattle are very appreciative of me when I come down every day and I move them to a different field. Now, I don't know if y'all been led into another field or not tonight, but I hope it has been. But it's been my pleasure to be with you, and I'll be glad to entertain any questions, and I'll try to answer them.